Thank you for joining the R Street Institute's event on ESG, Responsible Investing or Culture War Battlefield. My name is Jerry Theodoru. I'm the director of the R Street Institute's Finance, Insurance, and Trade Program. I'm very pleased that our special guest today is Rob Barnum. Rob is an ESG risk manager at NEAM, headquartered in Connecticut. Prior to NEAM, Rob was a director in the analytics and quantitative research group at Conning Asset Management. And prior to Conning, Rob was a trader and an analyst at Cigna Investment Managing Management, focusing on securitized products and variable annuity hedging. And he was at Citigroup prior to that. So let's start with a uh, short definition of ESG. What is ESG? Well, as many of you know, it refers to environmental, social, and governance factors or considerations in investments by asset managers or by asset owners. Some have called it more than just a consideration of factors, but have termed it a movement or a philosophy or just a strategy. Others use a more colored term and call it an agenda. Now, the debate between ESG and anti-ESG proponents has been getting hotter and hotter. It's a really fierce debate. Temperature is high. And unfortunately, the debate is not constructive at all times. In some fora, it has become vicious with, with name calling, with vituperation, with ad hominem attacks, with accusations of conspiracies, and it's getting out of hand at, at times. The, the debaters include politicians that are trying to score points with their constituents, think tankers, with agendas, and academics have also entered into the fray. Last week, on Tuesday, less than a week ago, there was a, a hearing by the House Oversight Committee, it was the second hearing in a few weeks, on ESG, where one of the witnesses declared that the S of ESG, or the social factors, promote gender transitions in children. Now, that was the second ESG hearing in, in a couple of weeks. At the first one, a few weeks prior to that, the distance between the positions advanced by two state attorneys general that were at the hearing and a state treasurer from the other was so wide that you could drive a truck through the two positions. Now, the debate boils, boils down to two extreme positions. At one end, we have the sustainability police or the ESG police, the uh, extreme ESG forces, the extremists that are demanding more and more data more disclosure, more information. And one environmental group that's in this extreme ESG camp maintains that action is necessary to avert the extinction of human and all species. That's a quote. That's what they maintain. And at the other polar extreme, the anti-ESG forces proclaim that, the, that ESG considerations or ESG will lead to the extinction of capital markets in the United States. And one state treasurer in this camp characterized ESG as Satan's plan. So choose your side, choose your poison. If you listen to these two extreme positions, we're all going to die. But that's why I'm pleased that our guest today is, is not a politician, nor an extremist of any persuasion or profession. And Rob, uh, I promise not to yell at you or get out of hand if you promise the same for me. And we'll keep this, this civilized. Um, so, Rob, could you tell us a little bit more about NEAM? You know, what is NEAM and what, what do you do there? You're an ESG risk manager. What does that mean? What does that entail? Yeah, so uh, NEAM stands for New England Asset Management, and we're a third-party asset manager for predominantly small to medium-sized insurance companies. Uh, we're based uh, here in Connecticut. We also have operations in uh Dublin and London as well, uh, but primarily here we're based in the U.S. and we have a whole host of 100 plus uh, uh, insurance accounts uh, ranging PC, um, life, also on the health side uh, and, you know, across the country and uh, throughout uh, Europe and Bermuda. Right. And, and what is uh, the role of an ESG risk manager? What, what's your job like? Right. So where our position uh, as a firm stands is probably uh, can be told from my title. It's ESG risk manager. 
uh, and it's not exactly, you know, head of sustainability sales or products. So we don't have anything that we're particularly pushing here. We're, uh, our little quote is partnership at work. That's kind of our company little phrase or trademark, you'd say. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. We have clients with different persuasions on this, some um, a little more down the road. You know, you could imagine that would be more of our European audience. Uh, some of those maybe in the heartland here, the U.S., uh, not so much. So we're certainly not going to push anything on them. Um, but as a uh, ESG risk manager, you know, would I'm, um, as opposed to herding the cats that we have all internally, trying to get everyone to think about ESG and how that affects their particular sectors um, and see it as more of a, a risk uh, idea, something more um, that we want to protect the downside uh, rather than, you know, push on to people certain societal or environmental uh, things. Now, we certainly have clients that want to do that, and we try to uh, accommodate them in, in numerous ways to do that. Right. And the, uh, the the preferences, I would imagine, are communicated from your clients with their investment guidelines, and then your, your colleagues then are executing the, uh, the strategies according to what the guidelines are. Uh, but have you seen in, in, in your time there or in the market as an observer of the market, a change in companies' investment guidelines to think about ESG factors, or has it been, um, you know, not, nothing to see here? Uh, it's been kind of a range. When I first started, I've been here just a little over two years. Um so I joined in the spring of 21, and I would say by the end of 21 uh, is maybe what I call like peak ESG exuberance, uh, meaning it it just felt like every day there was on the cover of Wall Street Journal, you had some article talking about it, all the different clients, even if they didn't weren't interested in it, thought they should be. So everyone was just grasping at straws, uh, like, what should I do? Should I put anything uh, into our portfolio? And it was just a little like, hey, hold back, wait, uh, what's really, uh, what are you really trying to accomplish here? Uh, rather than just keep up with the Joneses, it needed to be more of a, in our opinion, a holistic, genuine um, kind of uh, persuasion for them to uh enact these kind of uh investment guidelines as a and not just uh like i said keep up with the joneses but it was really going to be genuine something that it really was a value to their organization to do um so it meant just a lot of conversations like breaking down exactly why they were interested in this what they were trying to accomplish and at the end of the day um, you know, they use a sports analogy here, almost like from the Tour de France, everyone wanted to be in the Peloton. It seemed like at the end of the day, there were no breakaway riders that wanted to go to the forefront. I mean, there were a couple that we had, but, and there was a, not really anyone who wanted to be, you know, cleaned up by the, uh, the bus at the end, sweeping up the slow riders, but everyone just wanted to move with the herd. Um, so once you got that accomplished and figured out where they wanted to go, then we could kind of direct them to say, here are the options of things you could be doing. Um, and, you know, there's a whole host of different ways that they could attack this problem. Yeah. And uh, if, if I understand correctly, your firm is uh, heavily focused on fixed income instruments, bonds, rather than, than equities or, uh, yeah, other instruments. Right. So that... Um, you know, I'd say 95 plus percent of, you know, holdings are in fixed income orientation of some sort. So many of the things that you'll find on the impact or sustainability side um, of the equation. So I put the whole thing like you have this uh, overlapping or overarching kind of umbrella of sustainable investing and you have uh, numerous different types of sustainable investing underneath that. You have ethical investing, impact investing, socially responsible, uh, socially responsible investing, ESG is a category under that. that. Um, so a lot of those impact oriented things tend to be on the equity side. Um, so it does make it a bit challenging for those uh, who have this fixed income portfolio that wanna do some impact there. 
the big tool that people use are ESG labeled bonds, or you know, more in the common vernacular, green bonds, as they're referred to. So it seems to be a popular choice that people will go down. Yeah, and it's interesting that you, you talk about some of the different flavors. Uh, and I would maintain, and, and you know, I'd be happy to hear your your thoughts that it's not an entirely new consideration, ESG factors. Like you said, it got frothy when it was brooded about in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, and everyone was getting involved in conferences and consultants you know, jumping in and we can help you with this. Uh, things have, have calmed down. But if you look historically, I think that the, the responsible investing or principles for responsible investing have been around for a long time. I mean, I'm familiar with a, a fund called uh, the Calvert Funds, Calvert mm -hmm. is Morgan Stanley, and they've been around since since the 1980s, introducing these kinds of funds. And like like you, they offer different different strategies. Some of them are screeners; they're like negative screeners. You, know, you wouldn't be surprised to see the uh, the church endowments of some of the socially liberal sort of you know social gospel churches with billions of dollars of assets, saying we don't want our money in tobacco or firearms or alcohol or any of those kinds of mm -hmm. things. So we have positive screeners. Well, we want, you know, food and, and water and automobiles or, or whatever. So that's that's been there for for a long time. And if if you you know look at the three elements individually, E for environmental, uh we've had these environmental considerations since the uh, oil spills, ExxonMobil and Exxon Valdez. So environmental risk is, is always there and a company that doesn't have appropriate controls risks uh, destroying shareholder value or bondholder value in your case. And on the S, on, on the social, uh, firms that have uh, poor cultures with harassment and uh, lack of um, uh, codes of conduct will suffer uh, reputational loss and, and shareholder value, bondholder value, and uh, on the G, G is certainly not not new. Governance firms uh, need to have their their boards of directors and their their top officers uh, directing companies in ways that are consistent with their fiduciary obligations. Just as fiduciaries of uh, of uh, in asset management positions, directors and officers need to be uh, exercising their duties appropriately otherwise we'll have cases like Theranos and SVB Bank or or WorldCom or Enron in 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 you know prior generation so governance good governance has always been a requirement and analysts such as yourself or others will look at the look at the uh, governance uh, when i talk to sell side sell side analysts of of equities I ask them, you know, what do you look for? And they say, we would like to talk to the management to see how engaged they are, how much they know, uh, what their planning is like. Uh, and so the G is, is, I would argue, not new. In the insurance world, you have directors and officers liability insurance that's there. It's a $15 billion market that would, covers events that come out of directors that are um, not, not involved or making poor decisions. So it's... Uh, it's a it's a different kind of a focus rather than a uh, something that's, that's that's totally new, and I'm not surprised to say that you know you're saying that it, it's died down. The hubbub, the commotion, has died down in your world, but not in the in the public sphere because I think it's become a a proxy for culture wars, which is why the the question um, that that is the subtitle of, of this uh, discussion, Rob, which is. Um, uh, responsible investing or cultural war battlefield. I think it's both. It's, it's become both. And then on the insurance side, since you're focusing on insurance companies, one thing that probably differentiates your firm from other asset managers is that you've got to take the long view because life insurers have got horizons of 30, 40 years before they their liabilities come due. So it's not as if you can think about these things on a quarterly basis, get in or get out of a particular of a particular issue, but you got to take uh, the long term view. But anyway, I've talked a lot. So what, what are your thoughts on, on whether this is really just another flavor or iteration of what we've actually encountered in the past? And it's not something that sort of suddenly just emerged out of nowhere and is threatening either the um, destruction of the capital markets and the elimination of fiduciary responsibility 
or, or the opposite, or if it's another another lens to look through as you look at a company, hey, let's look at the environmental concerns. Let's look at the social uh, concerns um, and, and, and the governance. Uh, thoughts on that, on the history and what makes insurance special? Yeah, I would, on your first point about uh, this being around a while, I would totally agree. It was, I think, my first introduction to actually ESG, um, that term, um, in a more formalized way. About six plus years ago, I was at another uh, company, and uh, the head of credit there asked me to look into this thing called ESG for an upcoming important project. So I was like, sure. And I signed up for a little uh, local CFA lunch and learn. And what I was expecting to find was those uh, religious oriented uh, equity funds. I think maybe, I don't know if Calvert's specifically religious oriented, but I had memory of them, at least when I came uh, out of the my undergrad in the mid 90s, some of these social funds and things that were out there. So I was thinking that was really all ESG was going to be. So, you know, if you think about this broad um, investing world as like a house, ESG to me was going to be like a little closet in a back upstairs hallway. Um, so I go off to this lunch and learn uh, thinking I was going to encounter some little closet of content and depth. And you got there and it was like, wow, it was like all this stuff uh, that it was touching everything, um, you know, it, the big one, as you alluded, I think you said Milton Friedman before, it was like the big one that, hey, in this world, shareholder value doesn't rule the day, stakeholder value does. You know, that was all pretty new to my, based on the education things that I had been through. Um, you had all these contradictions and trade-offs, you know, electronic vehicles, nuclear, I remember being, I think on the panel was a, a German person and a French person arguing a little over nuclear there. Um, so it, it was pretty much more than I expected when I walked into it. Um, and it does uh, bring so many different points, uh, at least emotional points to it. People have their ideas uh, about it. Uh, if you want to go back even further of what you're talking about history, I think it was more of those kind of what you might call Christian groups way back when, you know, the Quakers, I think if you look on a Wikipedia or something or referenced kind of the originators, and now it's almost more so the religious group maybe on the right pushing back strongly on that. And I think it comes down to a few issues of, you know, maybe general, uh, maybe a lack of knowledge, which would be like my part thinking of what ESG was, maybe a, a dose of tribalism and some ideology there. Uh, difference um, that has caused a lot of this uh, commotion. And if I was uh, led before that, I, I think I turned to ESG exuberance, maybe it was in 21, Does it hasn't diminished the conversations that we've had. It's just changed it from everyone wanting ESG, it seemed like for who knows what reason, now to almost retreating the other way of avoiding it um, in some ways because they think they might upset certain stakeholders within their, you know, certain customers or, you know, other people on their board um, to that nature. Yeah, it's uh, great that you used the word exuberance because that takes me back a few decades to um, uh, Alan Greenspan talking about irrational exuberance. <laughs> and, and if you go back a couple of uh, more years or, or decades, uh, Rob, I'm glad that you mentioned Milton Friedman because uh, I didn't say it at the outset outset, but our street institute, we are a free market oriented think tank. We believe in free market solutions. We've always been uh, admirers of Milton Friedman. And it was in 1970 when he advanced what, what you mentioned, the um, shareholder primacy doctrine, where corporations have no higher purpose than maximizing profits for their shareholders. And it gave rise to the catechism. If you go down to Wall Street and ask, you know, what's the purpose of a corporation? It's increased book value per share, increased book value per share, and increased book value per share. And it ended there. Then uh, more recently, you've had this uh, this business group, the business roundtable, which consists of the CEOs of about a couple of hundred of the largest U.S. corporations. Business roundtable put together a, a manifesto, which is supposed to be an updating of Milton Friedman's uh, share, shareholder uh, primacy doctrine. And the Business Roundtable Manifesto 
has a couple of points, uh, has five points actually. They deliver value to customers is first. Invest in employees, second one. The third one, fair and ethical dealing with suppliers. Fourth, support your communities. And fifth, generate long-term shareholder value. So in many circles, you talked about that exuberance, people are getting frothy and excited about ESG. In many circles, people began to think that Milton Friedman and his theories are now passe and a thing of the past. And as a matter of fact, Fortune magazine, three years ago in, in 2020, had an article uh, saying that Milton Friedman's shareholder doctrine is dead on its 50th anniversary, because it was 50 years from 1970 to 2020. Mm. But if you think about it in a more nuanced way, deliver value to your customers, invest in your employees, deal ethically, support your communities, those actually feed into number five, which is generate long-term shareholder value. So I would argue that the, that the two are not inconsistent. It's not Friedman's world right. or business roundtable manifesto world. I think that Friedman is back. So if his, uh, he's coming back to life. Um, and I think it's very interesting, uh, your, your more historical point of view on, on the Quakers and, and sort of the, uh, the religious right back then actually favoring socially responsible investing and today's religious right having a different uh, viewpoint. But we're not here to have a religious discussion on a Tuesday <laughs> afternoon. Um, yeah, so the, um, one of the, the big things now is, is about disclosure. Is about disclosure. Companies disclosing the condition of their companies or the action of their companies or their positions or the act of their companies with respect to, to ESG. And uh, part of the debate, the red hot debate that I talked about at the outset does revolve around disclosure. You've got the radical uh, pro ESG types that want more and more and more disclosure that is very burdensome for companies. And a lot of it is maintained to be irrelevant. Um, but uh, and then you've got companies that try to paper over things and put uh, lipstick on a pig, so-called greenwashing to make themselves look as if they're doing all the right things. But in fact, they're not. So do you have any thoughts on, 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 on disclosure? What information is needed as, say, the analysts in, in your group look at companies? What, what do they look for? Are they satisfied with what GAP requires and, and the SEC requires in the 10Ks? or is um, many companies are having disclosures on, on environmental and, and ESG, and they're incorporating that in, into their risk factors in the 10K, which I noticed pretty recently. But do you have any, um, any, any thoughts on, say, put on the hat of an analyst? What would you look for as, as an analyst or what for disclosures? Yeah, so most of the firms that we tend to look at, we skew maybe up uh, in the market cap size of companies, you know, more the S&P 500-ish. And those companies are very good at disclosing things um, as opposed to maybe your small caps, mid caps, emerging market companies. Those aren't exactly, you know, strong suits for us. So we don't have a lot of experience. And I, from my understanding is it's really hard to come by some of this ESG data from those companies. Um, if I use, you know, more as a, uh, a point in case on that would be um, some of the ESG ratings. So again, by uh, I think I talked before about the umbrella of sustainable investing. And so if ESG focuses more on that non-financial information to try to unravel and get uh, uncover some financial impact of a company and those ESG data sets, um, the ESG ratings kind of target that mindset. They're going to look at this non-financial info and they'll either assign a rating, which would be like a credit rating, but it's different, um, or a numeric score uh, that goes there to try to say how, this is how much ESG risk is present. And those companies that are large cap tend to score a little better in those ESG rating models because a large part of that data that comes there is self-disclosed from these companies. So your S&P 5-ish, 500-ish uh, companies, they disclose a lot. So they kind of skew to have better scores as opposed to some of these smaller ones. And we can see it. 
Um, we use a particular company called Sustainalytics, and we also have access to MSCI, and we can kind of to see that play out. It's not a perfect correlation between size and how much they disclose, but it it's pretty strong um, relationship there. Right, and the uh, yeah, so you you look at those factors, and some of the anti ESG forces are arguing that uh, asset managers, you know, should not make these, uh, you know, look at these these factors. Um, but I would argue that the that the um, fiduciary duties that asset managers have requires them not to ignore factors that could have a bearing on, on future performance. So it's um, it, I think what we're, we're coming to in our discussion is that the the middle view is, is the one w which is probably better to to hew to. It's neither the imposition of a uh, neo Marxist, socialist, communist agenda, and it's also not um, something to um, uh, demand all sorts of disclosures and to, and to squeeze companies. So, uh, yeah, and then the, the long view is something I think is important for, for someone such as yourself, Rob, because the, uh, as we said, the liabilities that insurance companies have are long, and also they face exposure at a couple of different levels. It's not just on the investments and the the value of their bonds and, and and the coupon and the yield, but also property casualty insurers certainly you've got another dog in the race, which is insuring a physical plant, ins insuring companies that um, against uh, destruction, physical destruction, or from liability from lawsuits. So they've got exposure at, at two ends. One is the uh, the insurance side, and the other is the investment side, with insurance companies being you know huge investors. The um, the, the cumulative uh, asset base of property casualty life and health is about um, uh, nine trillion dollars. Um, so you've got um, very large, large asset base there to, to keep an eye on. Um, yeah, and uh, if there's any questions that uh, you have, um, you can post them in the um, the Q and A box uh, down below. Send those across, and uh, the. Uh, Latest news that I've, I've been seeing on in insurers with respect to ESG is the virtual collapse of something called the Net Zero Insurance Alliance, the NZIA, mm -hmm. where you had uh, several, a couple dozen global insurance companies that signed on to a, a Net Zero uh, uh, Insurance Alliance. But doing so introduced the possibility of antitrust li litigation. So that's been falling apart lately. The large reinsurers and other global insurers have dropped off of that because they don't want to be perceived as colluding or being in violation of any antitrust. Uh, but other than that, I hope that there will be more e educational and, and productive discussions where people are focused on, on the facts and understand uh, what, what's going on in the business. And I, that's why I'm very happy that we had someone like Rob with us today, whose boots are on the ground and not up in the sky with uh, uh, posturing and taking the discussion into these uh, danger zones as has been done. The the bottom line is, is fiduciary responsibility is not going away. It's not being diluted. It's not being dented. It's in the statutes of corporate for, for corporations in states. So fiduciary responsibility does not um, uh, conflict at all with um, ESG factors uh, is, is, is where I come down. So... Uh, hearing no questions. Thank you, Rob, for joining us today. This uh, session will be available, recorded, available uh, in a couple of days. So feel free to pass it on to your colleagues and friends that would like to learn a little bit about ESG and certainly uh, the intersection of ESG and the insurance industry. So this is Jerry Theodoro saying thank you. Thanks, Jerry.